like quick two announcements up here. Firstly, we have a new, uh, some of you uh, looked at the website and I had a comment asking you just to check that you can see 3P4 on Avenue and a few of you wrote that you could not. That problem should have been fixed this morning, so if you log into Avenue, please make sure you can see 3P4. The reason it's very important, if you can't see 3P4, I cannot see you, which means that I don't have your email address and then I cannot send you uh, emails regarding the electronic online tests. So if you, if you cannot see 3P4 on Avenue, let me know right away, otherwise you'll miss out on that first electronic test which is coming up next week. So make sure of that. And then secondly, assignment one has been posted. It's due 20th of January, so next week, Monday, in class. Well, not next week, Monday, Monday after that, in class. Okay, so, and we'll work through uh, some of those questions in assignment one and the tutorial on Monday and Friday next week. Okay, there will be some other questions during the tutorial, but um, the assignment is there's one big question in that assignment that we'll cover in the tutorial. That tutorial also carries on with 3E left door. Okay, so in the tutorial and in the assignment, there's a question that's exactly from 3E. Bring your laptop, bring that lab to the tutorial if you want. Um, that will help you get a head start on that question. Okay, then we'll work through that question. So MATLAB, ODE45, all those things that you learned near the end with Dr. Adams. Um, I checked with them, you guys covered it. I'm going to use some questions from your last assignments and we'll, we'll just basically continue on with 3E into 4E, uh, which is exactly what's intended for this Okay, so any questions based on those two answers? Yes. It's all on my website. As I said in the first class, everything is on the website, on my website. I can't do anything on Avenue except the grade. So last time we looked at, at feedback control and control in general, and we said that there's four elements in control. Take a look at this diagram. Can you see the four elements? Maybe before you even try to find the third four elements, What's going on here? It's a boiler. What is being heated? Okay, in your apartment building or at home, you likely have one of these in your basement. So a big vertical tank. Except that's not quite the same thing. In your condo or apartment, wherever, what you have is a batch system. This is not a batch system, this is a continuous system. Okay, but same idea, we're trying to take cold water and turn it into hot water. So what are the four elements? What's the first one? The objective, the set point. Okay. The temperature set point. And where is that? The operator's head. Okay. So the operator, she or he knows where they want the set point to be. What's the second element that we need? Sensor, okay. We have that over here, the indicator. Measuring the temperature in that hot water pipe leaving over there. What's the next one? The algorithm? And where's this algorithm? These are not trick questions. Feel free to interact, right? Where's the algorithm? skip over that one, what's the fourth element? The control valve, okay, so that's labeled there for us. So let's come back to the third element. Right? They're all in sequence, right? So somewhere in between the, sit, the sensor and the control valve, we have to have the algorithm. It's the operator. It's the operator again. Okay, so the operator's got two things. She already has the set point in his head, and she knows also how to adjust that valve to turn it to achieve the desired temperature. Is that an effective controller? Is that an effective control system? It's an expensive one, and it may not be quite effective after the eight hour shift. That temperature may not be exactly where you want it to be, okay? So we replace that manual process, but 
before I move away from the slide, this is valid feedback control. Okay? We don't need a computer to do feedback control, but we often do, so we replace it with something that looks like this. We're going to see these symbols and diagrams in the tutorial on Monday and Friday next week. So here's a temperature transmitter. Sometimes we just drop off that second T and just write a single T. So it's the temperature sensor. We've got some instrumentation that, that's in line there measuring that temperature. AF, air okay. We supply air to that temperature transmitter because then that temperature signal is sent by a pneumatics to some sort of control system. Okay. So this pressure in this air, air pipe, it's a very thin pipe, that the pressure is in proportional to the temperature measurement. So if there's a low temperature being read there, the pressure in that air pipe is low, high pressure will send a higher pressure signal. Or we could replace it with an electronic signal. Okay, so you send a low number of millivolts or a high number of millivolts. So you'll see this in all the plants. Many people will work in established plants that have been built in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. They will use air to transfer the signal. Newer plants will use an electric uh, circuit. Even newer plants still will just have that at all wireless. So wireless transmission to some centralized system. But there's issues with reliability on wireless signals. So we don't see that a lot, especially on critical variables. So here's my control system. Notice the SP set point. So if you've got this printed out, this is on the website. If you've printed it out and brought it to class, you can see the SP over there. And then you see the PV. PV is sometimes used instead of CV. Process variable, control variable. Um, TIC is indicating temperature <coughs> indicator control. So I saying it's indicating temperature. Well, it's indicating it because this little blue arrow moves up and down depending on where the temperature is. The red one stays fixed. That's the set point. That's where you want it to be, say, 200 degrees Celsius. And then this blue line on the right-hand side moves up and down below or above, depending on how far away that process is. And then this control system is doing a calculation and sending a signal to the valve and telling the valve open and close by a certain percentage. So go to 0% is, is fully closed, 100% signal telling the valve to be fully open. Okay, so again, this is transmitted through a pressure signal to this valve. And then that valve will automatically open and close depending on the signal coming in. Opening and closing through the gas. Okay, so we've replaced this overpaid control system, this overpaid operator, we've replaced it with some equipment that's a little bit cheaper, more reliable, and likely is going to do a better job for us at controlling that temperature. And our goal in this class, we're going to learn a, a bit about how these sensors work, we're going to learn how these valves work, but most of our time is going to be spent on learning how to design those control systems and how to set the algorithms in that group. So here's another example. Let's take a look at this. So what I'm, all I'm going to tell you is that feed A is acid and feed B is base. What is this system doing? Hydration. Neutralization. Okay. What's the objective with the system? <coughs> Controlling the pH? How do you know that? How do you know it's pH? tell us what type of analyzer. It could be pH, it could be dissolved oxygen, it could be percentage of a certain component in the system. Okay, so A is a generic analyzer, and usually on a diagram there will be a subscript somewhere 
this sensor will be labeled, for example, this might be AC105, and somewhere else is a table that tells us AC105 is measuring dissolved oxygen pH. And, and clearly, it's, it's most likely going to be pH if A is an acid and B is a base. Okay? So pH, by analyzer, the C is referring to control. So I'm controlling pH likelihood here. Cause and effect. Is there a valid cause and effect in the system? Yes. Okay. So, what do you do if the pH is too low? What do you do to the valve? Open. open. Okay. That valve is open at a certain value. Feed A coming in here suddenly becomes a little bit more acidic. What do we call that when that happens? So I'm controlling the base by opening and closing that valve, measuring the pH, here's my control loop. Separate from the control loop, A, at my acid coming in, instead of being a pH 4, I'm now coming at pH 3.5. Someone's mixed up a new mixture of acid that had made a mistake and now it comes in at pH 3.5. What do we call that type of event? Disturbance. Okay. What's going to happen in that system? going to go down in the CSTR, and when this pH detection occurs, it's going to send a signal to open that valve a little bit more. Okay? So there's going to be a time delay. This pH comes in at 3.5, but this whole tank doesn't suddenly drop in pH. There's going to be a time delay. Some dynamics are going to occur, depending on this tank volume. So the bigger the volume of the tank, the longer it's going to take before we actually pick up the pH is too low. That was a really small tank, we're going to pick that, that up right away. So there's dynamics. That's going to be our focus of next week's class. Okay, it's how fast these things occur. Then we're going to measure pH. Now there's time delay and dynamics on the sensor as well. This sensor doesn't pick up the change in pH instantaneously. Some delay also. And then we send a signal over. That signal is pretty much instantaneous. Electronic signals are, are rapid. And that valve may change, and the valve may open really slowly. But we don't, remember from last class on Wednesday, we said we don't like to make sudden changes on our system. We're going to open that valve a little bit gradually and open up the base. Then we have to now have base come in, and that's going to mix in as well. Time delay over there. So it could be a full minute before we get our pH stabilized over here again. So that's going to be our focus of the next few classes is these dynamics and quantifying how long these events take. Take a look at this system. Without telling you anything, yes? No, the delays are just considered as inhibitors of control performance. Okay, so near the end of this course, we're going to look at three things that inhibit control performance, and delays is one of them. Let's come to this final example. What's going on over here? Take a look at that diagram for a minute. What do you think might be occurring in the system? Talk with the person next to you. I know what's the cause and effect. That's what I want you to figure out. What's the cause and effect?
So this control loop is actually almost like a fine-tuning type of idea. That you can get very sensitive control on this system without overshooting or over-controlling some control. So there's actually reasons why we sometimes design our systems in a way that might seem a little unusual. Okay, so my challenge to you is whenever you see a PNID diagram, okay, so PNID diagram. not equal to PID controller. One unfortunate terminology we're going to have to deal with in this course because we use both 
in this particular course. So typing an instrumentation diagram is not the same as the PID, the proportional integral derivative controller that we're going to look at later. So this is a PNID diagram up here. Whenever you get a PNID diagram, challenge yourself to take a look at it and figure out what's going on. Okay, and understand perhaps why certain loops and pairings have been made. These are not just made arbitrarily, they're often with a lot of thought behind it, um, and we need to try and decode and understand what's going on. Okay, so you'll have lots of practice with, with that in this course. Okay, so the main objectives that I wanted to cover in, in, uh, in this class was just recapping that material from last time. That's, like as I said, I posted a comment on the course website. The material from Wednesday's class and today's class is actually arguably some of the most important material for this course. It's our foundation for the next uh, 12 weeks. So make sure that we understand these concepts. And let's move on then and understand some of the objectives of control. And the first one is safety. It's not to make good quality products. It's not to um, it's not to make profit. Those are secondary objectives. One of the primary objectives in a control system is to ensure safety of, of the whole process. Okay, so let's take a look at this system. We saw this actually earlier. Here we've got a feed, a mixture of hydrocarbons coming in. Methane is by low key. So methane and ethane are going to report to the vapor phase primarily over here. And there'll be a little bit of methane coming in the liquid stream, but it's also going to be propane, butane, and pentane coming out of this flash dot. Uh, like you. Uh, sorry, it's like it's your uh, I don't know if you use the terminology separation process, but yeah. So it's ethane, methane are going to report to the liquid phase, and uh, the low dash is going to report to the liquid phase. Like so we preheat this feed. We preheat it in a heat exchange at H101 and H102. H101 uses a stream from another part of the process, another hot stream that we have available elsewhere, and H102 uses steam. We preheat that feed to get it to the right temperature so we get the vapor-liquid equilibrium split occurring to the liquid and vapor phase we require. So this Example is nice because it has all the seven elements that we want from a process control system. The first is safety. What can go wrong in a system which is closed? Someone just made a noise. <laughs> okay, explosion. Anytime you have a vessel that can be fully closed off, you risk explosion. There's a bell, there's a bell. There's a valve, there's a valve. This system can be fully shut. Okay. You've got heat, you've got volatile organic compounds, you can risk overpressurizing that system. Okay. So, for example, if all these valves B4 and B5 are closed, B3 is open and you keep pumping material in here, there's a limit to the capacity that that vessel can take. So we have B4 on a control loop with PC1. P, pressure, C, controller, we're manipulating that valve position in an obvious way. Pressure goes up, valve opens. Okay? So that loop is primarily for safety. PC1 is for safety. Do things always work as we expect? Okay, you've got a job interview. You need to drive all the way to Toronto. You need to get up at 5.30 in the morning to make sure you're there on time. What do you do? You set one alarm. You set two alarms. You set your cell phone and another alarm. You get something to phone you. Okay, so PC1 is not always going to work. B4 may fail. So PC1 will often, on safety critical loops, we'll put two pressure sensors, not just one. Okay? We'll put two pressure sensors, they're cheap, we don't care, 
The pressure sensors are all lot cheaper than replacing this flash drum and cleaning up the environmental mess when you spill hydrocarbons everywhere. So we buy a second pressure sensor, put them in, in parallel, and we measure both. And they should both agree with a little bit of error, but if one breaks, we pick the one that's got the highest pressure. We always control based on the one that's reading the highest pressure. And for safety critical. So safety is the first objective of control that we'll encounter. The second objective is environmental protection. So we want to make sure that we don't contaminate the environment. <coughs> if that vessel should reach a safe, unsafe operating point, we want to make sure that we're able to contain any of the material that's being released. Okay. So one thing that we do is recognize that there might even be occasions where this valve system doesn't relieve the pressure to our satisfaction. So there might be a blockage in this pipe over here. Something's coming through the system and it's, there's a blockage over there. It's unlikely, but it could happen. So we have SRV1, safety relief valve one. These are valves absolutely mechanical. Not a single electrical signal is involved. There may be all sorts of electronics and pressurized piping over here to make the system work. But SRV1 <coughs> is fully mechanical. It's just springs. These are things that are not going to fail on us or extremely low probability of failure. And that valve will open at a certain threshold pressure which we set. We set it so that that pressure will open that valve below the pressure at which this tank will burst. So if this tank will burst at say 300, we set that valve at 280. Okay, so it will open at 280 and move the material to a contained vessel where we can treat it. And before that vessel explodes and injures us and injures the environment. So environmental protection. Okay, SRV1 is also a form of equipment protection. Okay, there's another loop on this diagram that's doing equipment protection. Which one might it be? Another control system on there that's protecting our equipment. Uh, LC1 from liquid overflow. Okay, LC1 for, from liquid. It's a bit more specific. Uh, liquid overflow or a higher level of liquid. Okay, so the suggestion is that we don't want liquid going up into our vapor stream. Then we go. Okay, many cases these flash drums are implemented exactly for that reason to make sure we don't send liquid to that vapor stream up over there. What comes after this might be an adsorbent or a unit that really cannot handle any liquid. So a compressor, for example, or an adsorbent. We cannot be sending liquid into that, so we have a flash drum to ensure that we get vapor liquid separation over here. Anything else about LC1 that might be protected? That's a good one. Yeah. Any other aspect? Yes. LC1 is controlling the valve B5, and then we are controlling the pump, so the pump is going to run dry and we won't damage the pump. Okay, so we're going to use LC1 as a way to protect our pump. We're going to make sure that there's enough liquid coming in so we never run our pump dry. So some pumps cannot tolerate being run and dry. Or they, for a short period we can, but we can quickly lead it to being damaged if it runs dry. Okay, so LC1 is there for equipment protection. So you can argue PC1 is also there for equipment protection. We're protecting our equipment from blowing up. So control loops, multiple objectives. Notice we haven't covered safety or any, uh, sorry, we haven't covered profits or making good quality product yet. These are all lower down on the list. So let's go with the next one over here. The other one is smooth operation. So 
level. Let's take a look at level. Level is the same as the very first plot I put up at the start of this class, showing the temperature in the room, oscillating between 18 and 22 degrees. And we said that really that probably isn't good control, right? We would like our temperature to be constant. But actually then, we, as we discussed a little further, we said that it doesn't really matter. As long as the temperature is between 18 and 22, we're okay living in that environment. Level is another variable that's like that. As long as the level fluctuates, for example, between 5% and 45%, we really don't care. Okay? That level can just keep moving anywhere in between. We don't need tight control. So that's a term that we're going to hear later on, is tight control or careful control. So smooth operation simply says that when we need to, if this level is starting to go out of bounds, we don't suddenly open that valve or suddenly close it. We just simply gradually open it a little bit more and simply allow the system to slowly move back to where it needs to be. Same as when you're driving a car. You don't suddenly accelerate or decelerate so that you have a smooth, smooth operation of the vehicle. Here's another one related to that. What's going to happen to the system if I open FI1? So I send more flow into this heat exchanger. What's going to happen to this temperature? Go up or go down? FI1 is the sensor measuring flow. So if I increase my flow, what's going to happen to T2 and T4? Up or down? Down. down. Okay. T5. Down. My vapor liquid equilibrium. It shifts. My light key. I'm going to shift. I'm going to send more or less. More or less. Okay. More down here. So I'm going to send more light keys. What's going to happen over here? Open the valve and increase the temperature again. Okay. So now I've increased my temperature. This is steam. So I'm opening up my steam valve. I'm calling for more steam. My, re my boiler somewhere else in the process now has to provide more steam for me. So whenever you make a change on this unit, it's going to cascade onto other units. Changes on the system doesn't remain within the system. Almost always you will affect some other part of the process. And that's another reason why we want smooth operation. We don't want to send sudden shocks and propagate them through our process to other units. We like to make gradual changes. Smooth operation is important for that. What's the fifth objective now? Okay, let's look at product quality. What's the loop that's on this uh, PID that's judging for product quality? of that stream going to the river. So this is now probably more in line with what you expect process control to be is called the controlling to get good quality product. Sixth objective for process control is profit. So very often product quality and profit go hand in hand. If you get good quality product, you can usually get higher value for that. But here's another example of profits on this flow sheet. Here's an interesting one that maybe you didn't pick up on the first time. What is AC1? Is my manipulated variable, controlled variable, disturbance? What is AC? Manipulated, controlled, disturbance, controlled. What's manipulated? Which one? What's 
manipulating V1 and V2. V1 and V2. Why are we manipulating two things? Okay. Devin's saying it's cheaper to manipulate V1 than it is to manipulate V2. Right? We get this hot process fluid is there on our process anyway. Steam is something we have to create and put money into. We have to buy fuel to create steam. So what we'll do is we'll open V1, and then when V1 gets to 100% open, and let's say we still need more heat, then we'll start to switch over to V2. Okay? So that's profit. We design our control loop so we can maximize profit. Another way of saying that is we try to minimize cost. So first use your cheaper forms of heat and then switch over to your more expensive heat. So those are six objectives, and then finally, there's monitoring, monitoring of the process. We will use our temperature sensors and other sensors on our process to track how our process is performing over time. So for example, we might track <coughs> over a period of months, we might look at fuel consumption, and we'll slowly start to see this sort of trend happen. Where can I try to troubleshoot and understand why is my fuel usage, perhaps here for the steam or for one, one of the other streams, why is that going up? So this is a much, much, this is lower down on the list. We'll talk a lot about this in 4C3 next week. You take that as an elective. We'll talk about process monitoring. So it's another final objective for our control system. Okay, now let's, uh, let's, we've got a few more minutes here, let's talk about some, one very unique aspect that you won't find in any other textbook that I've ever seen. Dr. Marlins is the only one that talks about it, and that's how do we quantify the benefits of process control. So even if you leave here and you decide, I never want to see control in my life, this sucks, I hate it, I don't want to do this ever, this is one place where you might have to deal with it. If you're working in a company and your boss says, you know what, I just had Aspen Technologies come. He graduated with me from grad school. I really like this guy. He's selling us a control system. I want you to evaluate whether it's going to have any benefits. How do you do that? Someone comes and tells you, here's a system that's going to save you tons of money. Do you believe it? This happens all the time in companies. People come by your company and offer you new products, new technologies. This is going to save you tons of money. How do you test that this control system will actually work? Simulate it. Okay. You can do that for sure. Oftentimes we say to them, well, prove it to me. And you, you actually run their control system for some days on, their pro on your process. You might run it on the weekends or on a product that you don't really care for, that's of low value. And you can then test whether that, that control system actually works. But how do you quantify that into dollars? And how do you convert the control system's performance into dollars? And say, this really is going to save me $10,000 a year. Okay, Con compare back to your raw material consumption, that might be one way. Think back, what's the objective of the control system? What's one of the primary objectives of your control system? To keep it at set point. So if you measure the deviation from set point, you can measure how well this control system is doing. Okay, so what we do is, let's take this analyzer, we're measuring, say, percentage methane in the stream. And we, we're getting this signal over time. Okay. So if we get that signal over time, one way you can consider that is then just to draw a histogram of that signal. Okay. So that histogram then tells you how poor your control is. So if over time, here's my signal, 
here's my set point. One thing I can easily do is take that data and draw a histogram of it, and I'll get something like that. You usually see that it's normally distributed. So if there's my set point. What you'll hopefully find is that the mean is at the, at the actual set point, and this is your standard deviation. Now a good control system will have a high standard deviation or a low standard deviation. Low, okay. All our effort is to shrink that standard deviation in. Why do we do that? Why is that desirable? Here's, here's an example that's very, very relevant. If you can solve this problem, you can make lots of money in your career. So any food packaging company or any company that's selling product by weight, they have to fill those bags or boxes or containers with material. And on that box it says there's one kilogram. Okay, so let's just work in grams here. So you buy something from the grocery store that's supposed to be one kilogram. There's a hard constraint. What does the company do? Do they set their machine to fill at one kilogram? They set it a little <coughs> higher. They may set it at 1050. So that only this small tail, let's say 1% or 5%, whatever some threshold is, let's work with 1%. So that one in every 100 people actually get a short change, but 99% of your customers get not satisfied. Okay. But 99% of the time, you're overfilling. So if you've got a way to reduce standard deviation, what can you do? <clears throat> right, reduce overfill. So if you can make that standard deviation look like that, you can shift that histogram over and put it over here. The moment you can reduce standard deviation, you can shift closer to your constraint. And that's how you quantify the benefit of the control system, is that savings. That's better for you because you're now not overfilling. Okay. So now you now instead of filling at 1050, you could be instead filling on average that now comes down to 1010. So you're saving a whole lot of money, and that could pay for that control system quite quickly. Now, that's not true, I'm uh, sorry, that principle is true in other areas of engineering. What you'll find in your career is that, and this is fairly intuitive, most of the time, the best place of operation is right at the constraint. So for example, think of it of a reaction that's occurring. You get the most conversion at high temperatures, but you've got a constraint on that temperature. You can't exceed a certain value before you start to melt the reactor or before you cause an unsafe operation. So your best area of operation is right at that boundary where you just have to constraint. So if you can push your control system to tighten that standard deviation and bring it really narrow, then you can shift closer and closer to that constraint. So many, many processes we find that our best operation is right under the constraint, and we can move that histogram over, so if we're just touching that constraint, we can make more money. But then we need really good control to do that. So this is why a lot of our effort in control design is spent on tightening that.
okay? So one way I want you to visualize this is as follows. Let's take a look at the system on the left. This is a system with no feedback. In other words, you just let it run and do its own thing. The manipulated variable is the reflux valve. What I'm referring to actually is this uh, example on the previous page. Okay, so there's my reflux valve going back into the distillation column. I'm measuring that purity, and I can adjust that purity by opening and closing that valve, the reflux. Send more, more of the liquid back into the column, you can adjust the purity. And if I leave it, that valve at 50%, so halfway open, I will see my composition change from 3% to 4% to 5%, it wanders up and down. So my input to my process, if I had to draw this process as a box, here's my manipulated variable. If I could draw a histogram of that process, that histogram is simply just a spot at 50%. It's a single, I'm not ever changing the valve before it open at 50%. But if I draw a histogram of my output by control variable, that histogram is very broad. My product is coming out at all sorts of compositions. That's open loop with no control. Now I decide to put a controller on. Now that control system is working beautifully, notice that it's maintaining a composition between 2.5 and 3.5%. So now, after this change to my process, I'm able to get a histogram that looks something like that. Very, very tight distribution, narrow distribution. But the moment I put that control system on, what is my manipulated variable doing? I have to make a change. I don't get this for free. Right? I don't get this benefit for nothing. I have to pay to do something. I have to change my reflux. Now my reflux starts to wander instead. Okay? So now my reflux, instead of being a single flat line at 50%, now my reflux, my manipulated variable is actually changing. Is this a problem? No, we're not selling this to our customer. We're selling this to our customer. Okay, so putting in variable inputs into your process so that you get a fairly constant or as close to constant output is a good thing. But this costs you money, absolutely. But you have to ask yourself, what's the difference between selling the blue product to my customer and the red product to my customer? It would be like you going to the grocery store and buying milk, and one day your milk is sour, the other day it's okay, then the next day it's sour. You never know what you're going to get. Our customers don't like that, right? We want constant product. So this last slide thing is a way to visualize exactly what I'm just showing you over here. An open loop process, your raw materials coming in, they're varying all the time, and you're going to get whatever product you get. And your input here is nothing. You don't put any, any input, your manipulated variable is nothing. You just keep it flat. The moment you put process control on, you get a very tight, good quality product at the expense of this very okay. So this is why we do control. Next class, we're going to start understanding more about this class, the process. We haven't spoken about this yet. We don't talk about that.